think the passage is on the back of your notice sheets as usual. So do please feel free. In fact, I encourage you to just have a look when I mention particular verses. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, please continue to bless us with your presence, we ask. Fill this place. Please open our hearts. Won't you speak your powerful and timeless truths into our hearts, we ask. In Jesus' name. Amen. So what does the Holy Spirit do? And what part does it play in our salvation? These are the questions that Paul starts to deal with in Romans chapter 8. In chapters 1 to 5 of this sublime letter, Paul was outlining the gospel, the wonderful news of our eternal salvation that Jesus Christ has secured for us. And then in chapter 6 to 8, Paul gets into how this affects and should affect how we live our lives. So last week we got to chapter 7 where Paul focuses on the, the problem of sin before giving thanks for our salvation and the promise of our eventual deliverance from it through Jesus Christ. Then in chapter 8 he begins to explore the instrument through which God rubber stamps our deliverance and gets to work in transforming us. The instrument is also God himself, God the Holy Spirit. Put simply, if God the Father planned our salvation and God the Son accomplished our salvation, then God the Holy Spirit applies our salvation to our experience. So in the next few minutes, I just want to briefly explore four aspects of the work of the Spirit in us that Paul mentions in this chapter. Firstly, the work of the Spirit resets the mind. Secondly, it gives life. Thirdly, it brings an obligation. And then finally, it brings a most blessed assurance. So firstly, it resets the mind. Just look at, if you will, look at verses 5 to 7 with me. It says Paul, Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. You see what Paul is saying? The presence of the Spirit begins to transform every part of us, including the way we think, what our basic attitudes are. The Spirit reorientates our minds. Minds that were intrinsically self-centred before knowing Christ and preoccupied with satisfying our own needs and desires are then minds that are becoming increasingly transformed into Christ-like minds. Minds that are increasingly focused on the things of God and on other people. Just in this instance, in this case, I'll put this in personal terms. I used to have quite a reputation for partying. In fact, the thing that was always preoccupying my mind was when I could next get drunk and smashed on a whole cocktail of various different Class A drugs that I thought was all I was wanted. And then who I could then find to use for my own gratification. That was the way my mind was naturally orientated. Now I'm still happy to be social, but my mind is preoccupied not with feeding insatiable desires of the flesh, 
but with how I might please and serve God. My mind is preoccupied not with um, seeking to use people, but in trying to be open to serve, help and love people. And especially, most especially, in people coming to know Jesus Christ for themselves. Is that happening for you? Is the Spirit at work in you? Slowly but surely reorientating your minds towards Him. When you go to work, are you there, for example, when you go to work, are you there trying to, trying to serve yourself and best others? Or are you trying to serve others and please God? When you come to church even, do you come just because of what you think you might get out of it? Or do you come equally for what you might be able to give others? Be that through your your singing, your, your playing, your welcoming, your serving, or just you being there for others. Paul says, if you've made a commitment to Christ, then the Spirit will be in you, changing you. Okay, secondly, the Spirit gives life. Just look at verses 9 to 11, if you will. (coughs) Says Paul, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. Can you see what Paul is saying here? He's talked a lot about the problems of our sins in the previous couple of chapters. But then here he is saying defiantly, do you not know just who the Holy Spirit is? And just how powerful he is? The Spirit is the one that raised Jesus from the dead. And he's now in you. Again, Paul is stressing, he's now at work in you. If your saviour is Jesus, and if you're seeking him, and trying to live for him, then the Holy Spirit and his power will be at work in you. He is. And he is more powerful than our own fallible, sinful flesh. And more powerful than the enemy too, for that matter. As Paul says in verse 10, (coughs) your mortal body is subject to death because of sin. But the power and authority of the Holy Spirit will one day raise that mortal sinful body to everlasting life. Just as it did Jesus's. That is how powerful the Spirit is. Because he is at work in you right now. If you believe. On what the Spirit has begun in you, he will complete. Let me put it this way. Imagine you have uh, a serious, debilitating heart condition. And I know that there's more than one person in this church, uh, in our church, for which that's not too far from reality. But what if you could get a transplant? (coughs) And unbeknownst to you, it just so happened to be a transplant from an Olympic triathlete who'd sadly died in a tragic accident. After the operation, you'd probably be like, Doctor, you know, is it okay for me to slowly get out of bed? What if my new heart can't cope? And the doctor could reply, don't you know the strength and power of that new heart that is in you? Your new heart will equip you to run triathlons and climb mountains. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the strength of the new spiritual heart 
that the Spirit of God Himself is moulding in you. And more than that, it is a power that will resurrect your heart when it finally does stop beating. Just as it did Jesus's. The Holy Spirit gives life. And why? Verse 10. The Spirit gives life because of righteousness. Whose? Jesus's. Jesus's righteousness. Again, let me put it this way. When your heart finally does give way, as all of ours will, or whatever organ it is that finishes us off, imagine at that point that you're then walking up to the pearly gates of heaven. And as you get there, the man at the gate says to you, why should I let you in? And you pause, and you produce a certificate of righteousness from out of your back pocket. And it reads, this is to certify that. Now just put your own name in there as I say this. It says, this is to certify that. Rob Oram has had every one of his sins forgiven. And the man looks at you and says, all of them? But there are just so many. And you reply, yes I know. There are an awful lot of them. And then you say, but that's not all. I've got another certificate of righteousness. And you hand it to him. And it says, this is to certify that Rob Oram has kept every one of God's laws perfectly. And a man just looks at you and says, this is absurd. This is a joke, right? Just where did you get these certificates? And you just say, Jesus gave them to me. With his dying breath on a cross, he handed them to me. God the Father, because of God the Son, and through God the Holy Spirit, has given you new life, eternal life. And that brings me to the the third aspect of the Spirit. It brings with it an obligation. Verse 12. Verse 12. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. But it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Now Stephen talked a lot about sin last week as he looked at chapter 7. And I talked um, about it at length a few weeks ago as we looked at chapter 6. Both of those sermons you can access online via our church website. And I do commend them to you. So I'm not going to labour the point again today. Except just to reiterate what Paul's attitude is to sin. He says, because of what Jesus felt obliged to do for us, that is to die for us, so we, empowered by the Spirit, must feel equally obliged to put to death the sins of our flesh. Again, let me put it this way. If you were bitten by a venomous cobra, a bite that would kill you, but then just in time someone gives you the antidote to the poison, you wouldn't then go out and start stroking that snake as if it was a pet, would you? No. Knowing what that snake can do, you would kill it. You would want to stamp on it, given half the chance. The Holy Spirit in you gives you that chance. Because now you have the power. Jesus said precisely this to his first disciples. He said this in Luke chapter 10, verse 19. 
Jesus said, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. If we are in Christ, we have the same access to the Holy Spirit that those first disciples had. And with it comes the power and authority that Jesus was referring to. So, ask the Spirit to show you what you need to do. Ask Him to empower you to command and conquer whatever it is that you know you need to deal with. But it's going to be different for all of us. But in your heart, you'll know what it is for you or what things it is for you. Fourthly and finally, it does bring with it blessed assurance, does the Spirit. A most wonderful assurance. For our Christian hope rests on certainty. It's not not some faint whim. It is an astonishing assurance. An assurance that in Christ you will be saved. You will not be condemned. Ever. Because when Paul says, when Paul says in the first verse of this chapter, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He means past, present and future. For anything you've ever done wrong, anything you're still getting wrong and are wrestling with, and for those future things that you might still get wrong, you will be forgiven. You have been forgiven. Christ died that you might be forever forgiven. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I really do hope that you take that away with you this morning. Because it's so important. And I know that because there's still many a day that I live as if I've forgotten this. So yes, the the work of the Spirit, it alters our mindset. He gives us life and gifts and the power to conquer sin. But just as fundamental as, as, as all of those, the Spirit gives us a blessed assurance. The assurance that you are a beloved child of God. And you now have a safe and secure destiny. Forever. In Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Bless you.